Hi, I'm Mark Weibrow and this is the Electronic Cafe, the channel for the lovers of electronic music. And I'm Andy McNabb. So, let's get started. So welcome to another brilliant edition of the Electronic Cafe. This is the episode that Mark and I will show you the interview we had with the fabulous Martin Ware of Human League, Heaven 17 and BEF. Absolutely amazing guy. I uh, can't wait for you all to see that. Before we get to it though, just want to make a couple of uh, updates, stroke announcements, because um, I haven't had a chance to do that recently. Lots of other brilliant stuff going on, the Electronic Cafe. Um, Mark and I had the really good fortune to reach out to a guy called Tom Saunders. Tom owns Silverback Publishing. Under that stable, he has the brilliant Blitz magazine, uh, which I know some of you or many of you would already have uh, subscribed to. If you haven't, you need to, and you can do it right here. I'll ask Mark to put a link at the bottom of the page. It's fantastic, and it's getting better. Um, it's like if the Electronic Cafe was a magazine, it would be blitzed. Um, so we met with Tom, had a great lunch, great chat. What a lovely guy. We're all on the same page in terms of our passion for bringing new bands and talking about great legends um, and just trying to bring it all together. So we've agreed that we're going to do some very cool stuff um, in terms of promoting each other. So uh, Tom's very kindly given Mark and I a page uh, for the Electronic Cafe to appear in every issue where we'll be reviewing albums or promoting things that we're working on together. Um, super, super excited about that. And the first um, piece of edit you'll see from us both is going to appear in the next issue. Um, but we've got lots and lots of other good ideas where we'll be doing um, exclusive competitions, bringing exclusive content, to electronic cafe people um, ahead of what's going on so you really are going to be ahead of the curve um, so tom thank you mate absolute delight to meet you we and mark and i are both super stoked about the amazing things we're all going to do together also want to announce um mark and i are dipping our toe into live music so electronic cafe live is coming to you guys in london in march next year bands are signed venue is signed can't wait to make the announcement. Just got a few little bits you want to do um, to before we go um, big time on this, but it's going to be huge and the start of something very special and another brilliant part of the electronic cafe journey that you're all joining us on. So when it gets announced, um, love you to get tickets, come and see the show, support the artists. They are brilliant. They are brilliant artists um, and they've all appeared on the EC. So we can't wait to uh, say announce our very first live event, which is happening early next year. Right, to the main show, or part of the show, Mr. Martin Ware. What else can we say about the guy? You know, he's done it all, he's made some amazing music, um, he's a very talented musician, incredibly smart man, um, very humorous, um, and we had a very enjoyable morning chatting to him. So sit back and enjoy our conversation with undoubtedly one of the synth pop electronic music pioneers and legend that is mr martin ware enjoy i'm not used to being called a legend on a monday morning i have to say <laughs> <laughs>
welcome everyone to this monumental moment of the Electronic Cafe. Look, we've been really privileged to meet some amazing artists since we started the show. Today is certainly no exception. We are so excited to talk to the fantastic legend that is Martin Ware. Martin, welcome to the Electronic Cafe. We are so pleased to have you here, my friend. I'm not used to being called a legend on a Monday morning, I have to say. <laughs> I, think, I think you are, Martin. I mean, yeah, you are. Your, your CV is pretty impressive. I think you, you've, had quite, you've had quite a good May, haven't you? You've got your second doctorate. Yeah, doctorate last week. Yeah. You've had yeah, your congrats. birthday, you've had your wedding anniversary. Oh, um, this week's been crackers, honestly. <laughs> um, wedding anniversary, birthday, doctorate. Just come back from Bilbao with my... Uh, we go on a, a mate's trip every every year to a different city. All nice. in one week. It's just wow. Cool. Nice. What a lovely place that is. Good yeah. Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it say, it's, uh, just going... I mean, yeah, where do we start with all the stuff you've done? I, I want to try and cover as much as we can because, you know, you've got such an impressive history, mate. Uh, and, and going back to 77, you know, Sheffield had punk, industrial, funk... Northern Soul, what was you into around that era? What, what was floating your boat? All the things you just mentioned, really. I, I used to go to Northern Soul clubs. Yeah. Um, but, the, the you know, the kind of mainstream clubs that were around in Sheffield at that time were very um, – it's a soul town. You know, yeah. I mean, people are into – uh, uh, mainstream soul music as well as, and you know, and historically Motown and everything. It was one of the f go to places for all those kind of tours that came over. Yeah. So I grew up, and you know, I've got older sisters who had a big record collection. So, um, they I was listening to their records, and they were all kind of pop and Motown and stuff yeah. like that. So, when I was growing up, I started as you try to get a sense of identity um uh, you kind of copy what your schoolmates listen to don't you so it like, starts off with like deep purple and stuff like that and then uh, and kind of rock and then yeah. it moved into really uh, the first kind of uh independent kind of thought i had on music was i used to, there used to be a boots in town in sheffield where you, where they'd have like record sales every six months and for some people for some reason people nicked record covers and so they had they used to sell like the actual albums remember they used to go in the back room to get yeah. the sleeves and put yeah, them yeah. Yeah. and all yeah. that well anyway so people nicked the covers thinking there was records in them i think <laughs> And um, so they used to have a, a sales of uh, albums that were like 50p and stuff they were perfectly fine, they just had no covers. And the first album I bought was like Alice Cooper, Pretties for You, because it was on um, it was on Frank Zappa's label, right? And uh, and at that time, I'd met Phil Phil Oakey, who was my best mate at school, and he he educate you know he really was ahead of me in terms of musical uh, eclecticism. So he. Uh, educated me about things like obviously Frank Zappa, but we we soon uh, and, and like then we got heavily into prog rock and King Crimson, Emerson Lick yep. and Palmer, and all uh, you know Van de Graaff Generator, which was nice. my favourite thing. And then we were lucky enough to have a record store called Rare and Racy near to where I lived in Sheffield, which was like a second hand record store, wow. and it was cheap. So you could go and buy something just because you like the look of it. Yeah. It was cheap. And then if you didn't like it, you'd just you'd take it back, get half the value back and buy something else. So awesome. um, I learned more from that than any amount of you know, going to college or anything yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, With a problem, a blood spattered curse on our land. Please cast your eye over this map, sir. This business is quite out of hand. I, I, I read. I read that. And correct me when you left school, you bought. Was it a Korg keyboard? Yeah, Korg seven hundred S. I mean, that's a little bit later on. That's um, after I left school and when I got some money. Yes, yeah. our, our family had no money. 
at all. I mean, you know, we'd often, the family would run out of money on like a Wednesday and my dad got paid on the Friday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he worked as a, worked as a tool maker. So, I mean, no, I, you know, I just thought that was normal. Yeah, where, where yeah sure, sure. I mean, so many, so many great bands have come out of Sheffield. I mean, you look at, you know, Human League, Heaven 17, ABC, Cabaret Voltaire, Voltaire even Pulp. Why do, you th- why do you think that is? What's the DNA in Sheffield that causes these innovations to come out of it? There's industrial towns, I guess, like Manchester and I guess London, and there's certain hubs where there's, an, there's a certain explosion of music at a given time. Yeah, it's... Right, so Sheffield, um, in the early 70s, a lot of the steelworks got closed down. So uh, not just the big steelworks, but the, the kind of uh, collateral kind of small um, uh, engineering shops that used to do finishing work and stuff like that. They were called Little Mesters shops. And um, a lot of those were in the city centre. Right. And when they closed down, they were just derelicts, right? And nobody wanted them because they were filthy and they'd need a lot of money to do them. So a lot of the landlords um, actually, you know, just rented them out for peppercorn rents. So, So that's... Factor one is the is rehearsal space. It was cheap, yeah, uh, and available. Um, secondly, there was the general thing that everybody I knew, uh, we all grew up with the sound of industry. You know, mm-hmm. it was everywhere in Sheffield. Yeah. So there's all these things in the city centre. You can hear the big drop forges in the in the industrial part of Sheffield uh, at night. You'd hear it. You know, it would they would they would kind of the infrasound would travel down the well, I didn't know what, what infrasound was at that time, obviously. It just it but it felt like a bit a bit of a heartbeat, you know. And um just loved it, you know. And then you I look back on it now and I think it must have been an influence on me loving kind of oh. found sound. And then there was not much to distract you in Sheffield. There's not a lot of venues at that time. The big bands would play the City Hall and there was some music going on at the Students' Union. Uh, but apart from that, there were no kind of really very, very few small venues. Um, so you had to make your own entertainment. <laughs> it was cheaper <laughs> as well. And, uh, and so all those factors and the fact that even though Sheffield's a big city, the kind of st- the city centre... And the uh, going up to where the students, um, the, the university and the students' union was, yeah. was all within a kind of half a mile radius. So every everybody kind of knew each other. There was a that's a, another thing. And I was just talking about this to a friend of mine yesterday. Actually, it seems highly unlikely, but it wasn't so much like a competitive thing. It was more like. Um, Everybody kind of supported each other because we didn't have. No, nobody really thought we were going to get signed up or anything. It wasn't like we were crawling over each other to be yeah. successful. We were doing it because we loved music and because we enjoyed it, you know. Uh, and so all those factors, plus the fact we loved going nightclub because it was the cheapest thing you could do in Sheffield for entertainment. Absolutely. So we were heavily influenced by dance music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And disco. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that kind of weird hybrid of, you know, uh, growing up with like, you know, Kraut Rock and Can and Noy and Amondul and all that stuff, and then all the credible stuff coming across from America uh, in the early seventies. You know, lest we forget, uh, you know, New York Dolls, Suicide, Blondie. Yeah, yeah. You know, they were all pro- pre-punk. All yeah, of them, absolutely. Yeah. So when punk came along, for us, it was a little bit like old hat, to be honest. Yeah. Sure. We've kind of been through that phase, and glam was a major influence. One day I might not care what happens to me Your lack of sympathy avails to disturb me I've got a life of my own Nothing would have, uh, my career wouldn't have existed were it not for the first Roxy Music album, probably. 
that was the biggest inspiration for us and Bowie, of course. Of course, who, who I read that was one of your, he was one of your early gigs in 78. Said, yeah. Said he's seen the future music. I mean, what was your reaction to that? Did you get to speak to him at that gig? Yeah, Martin? yeah. I've got a photo to prove it as well. I, I totally believe you, mate. That's amazing. No, no, no. Somebody else took it. I didn't take it. Uh, <laughs> there was no such thing as selfies. Well, there probably was. <laughs> uh, no, somebody happened to take a photo of the whole scene. It was amazing. Oh, wow. And... Um, but you can't imagine what that was like because we were just getting ready to go on stage at this really scuzzy kind of rock, big rock pub uh, in uh, Earl's Court. And um, it was so scuzzy, in fact, that it was one of those dressing rooms where it's covered with graffiti and flyers. And, yeah. and just, you know, it was it was grim. And, uh, in fact, the, the dressing room de didn't even have, have a door on it. <laughs> so... Consequently, it's not like somebody knocked on the door and go, hello, it's Mr. Bowie here. It was like him and his entourage. We just, just walked in. in. Just walked in. And we're going, it's like God had just come down and go, oh, <laughs> on a beam. I'm going, what the <laughs> fuck, you know. And um, his personal assistant, Coco, was there and... Yeah. Like all these people, and he's going, and he's smoking tabs, and like you know, I'm going. This is just mad. We were due to go on stage in ten minutes. Wow! And I've got an even better part of that story, which is um, I found out about uh, six months ago. Somebody told me we we played a gig about a month before that as a marquee club in Soho. Yep. I remember it just sold out many times over uh, it would have sold out many times over it's quite small but i was told by somebody who tried to get in outside that uh two of the people who tried to get in and the bouncers turned them away were uh, uh david bowie and Iggy pop no because it was full beyond fire capacity <laughs> they said it's like the classic don't care who you are you're not coming in you know <laughs> So 78, 78, that was kind of around about Heroes time. I mean, that was... It was, yeah, Heroes, the idiot. Like, like was it powers, really. Yeah, it was the idiot. But they were hanging out together at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But can you imagine? <laughs> Being turned away, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah any, anyway, away, but the good news is that we, you know, we got that, uh, we got to tour with Iggy Pop and what became friends. I did. Thing is, if you're not uh, nervous enough just about to go on stage, you've got David Bowie walking into your dressing room. <laughs> it just it was really sweet and it just said you know good luck and i'm sure you'll be fine and everyone we're going oh my god no pressure <laughs> then no exactly <laughs> <laughs> Travelog and reproduction when they came out. Did you know that there was? Did you have, or did you ever wish or know that it was going to be so revered forty odd years later? Um, I mean, they were so ahead of their time. I mean, we were definitely on a mission, but we had like a manifesto on the wall. You know, it was like, you know, no love songs, no, you know, you could there were a certain list of words we couldn't even use in the lyrics. It was like. No guitars, you know, because the uh, Queen used to have that thing, no synthesizers, right? <laughs> so uh, that was our response to that. And uh, and just like we were very focused on, uh, I have to say, it was more like an art project than it was a band. Yeah. I mean, we didn't go to art college. None of us did any of that stuff or university. <laughs> uh, but we were absolutely kind of fanatically uh clear about what we wanted to do and that we wanted it to have some kind of uh even in a small way some kind of timeless quality mm. yeah yeah uh and as I, as we used to say to each other at the time we should literally discuss it and say we want people to you know, to be listen to still be listening to this in ten years' time, because that's as far as we could imagine. You know, the idea of being thirty, yeah, 
thought definitely passed it, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think I think that you, you know the gig you did at the Roundhouse and that little tour with the two albums kind of told you they're still very much loved and yeah, well, I'm very very proud of those two albums. I think I think they've matured actually. Over, yeah. over, I mean the perception of them for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, the first album, weirdly enough, was not how we intended it to turn out because it was Colin Thurston who co-produced it with us, who just done, like, Duran Duran. Duran Duran, yeah. <laughs> and various other people. And, oh, I know what, what sold it to us was he'd just been an engineer on on um, Low. That's what sold it to us. Yeah. Because <laughs> that was our favourite album at that point, and still is, pretty much. And um, And he was a very good engineer, but what we didn't fully understand, because we weren't ex didn't have any experience really in big studios, is that he was really a technical engineer, right? And I don't think he had much to do with the kind of vibe, you know. I mean, now obviously I've been produced records for forty years. I understand how important it is to, yeah. you know, to encourage the artists to express themselves and give them confidence and all that stuff. And he was more of a technical engineer, so consequently. The stuff that we loved about the stuff we created in our own studio in Sheffield and the kind of roughness of it and the kind of, if you like, the electro-punkiness of it, yeah. he ironed out at all the creases. And we didn't know any better, you know. It was the first time we'd ever been in a big studio. So he ironed out all the creases. And that worked brilliantly for some things, like You Lot of Love Me Feeling, for instance. Yeah. But for other things... It just lost, it just ironed out the energy a bit for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but interestingly, when when it came to re uh, in the two thousands, they were remastered. I think two thousand and five. Yeah. And with new with new mastering technology like multi band compression and all that stuff, that revealed the true beauty of how we remember hearing it in the studio. Uh, so. The original, but the original one, particularly the original mastering. Uh, bear in mind, there were no CDs at that point. Sure. So when it was being mastered to vinyl, just kind of sounded a bit weedy. I yeah. don't know. I didn't really have much to compare it to because we weren't like anyone else. And even worse, when it got put onto CD, the original CD, they hadn't got a, they hadn't got a Scooby what to how, how to do that so they were taking the original mastering notes and just putting it straight onto a digital medium which is not what you need to or want to do there are so many other things you can do anyway it's all a bit technical but they put the the in a nutshell the remastered versions sound much better particularly things like you know almost medieval and and uh you know sound kind of chunky and yeah I mean, when we used to play that live, it was like, uh, you know, it was like a punk band, you know, more sure. electronic. Yeah, you know, yeah. O overloading the channels and, you know, giant blocks of sound drilling holes in your body and that kind of thing. <laughs> so the same in New Order. I mean, they were more punk band when yeah. not live compared to the, yeah. the albums yeah. that came out. Yeah. Um, you know, me and, me and Andy was been in bands. I mean, I'm a synthesizer player, and I listened to those early albums. And you know, no MIDI, no MIDI, monophonic synths, no quantization, no drum machine. They're, I mean, they're <laughs> incredible works of art, actually. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it was difficult to. Uh, well, no, we didn't think about it. That it was difficult. I, I mean, uh, I've said in many interviews, I think limitations are a creative thing. Yeah. No, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Uh, it forces you to make early decisions. Plus the tape technology, you know. I mean, we were writing things on initially on on Port Studio, and then and then kind of copying it on. <laughs> we had we had an eight track one inch Ampex machine, and we, of which two of the tracks didn't work. <laughs> so, uh, but it was a great sounding machine if you lined it up properly. Yeah. So. <clears throat> for us, that was like being George Martin, you know. I mean, we yeah. we couldn't believe the freedom, considering that that we did, you know, we created being boiled bouncing from track to track on a mm. on a quarter inch tape, you know. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. 
There's the Sister 100. Oh, wow. wow. Um, that's st uh, I still use. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Last piece of kit, that, mate. Yeah, that's not the original one, interestingly. I sold the original one. No, actually, it was Ian's. Sorry, we all used to use it, but Ian bought it. He sold right. it. But then uh, when I did Erasure's album in 92... Uh, me and Vince became big buddies and everything and there was a knock on the door one day just before Christmas and it was this bunch of boxes I'm going what the fuck's this <laughs> he's going, he bought me that wow as that a Christmas cool. present nice so I kept talking about how much it, I loved it oh that's and because uh, he had one as well in his studio got everything and uh, <laughs> he just bought it for me isn't that lovely that is that's so the cool. kind of guy you do it. See, Andy, that's, that's what friends do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Mate, just going back to Heaven 17, I mean, the impact on mine and Mark's youth for the when you guys started Heaven 17 is like massive. And I'll clearly remember buying Fastest Groove Thing on 12 inch, you know, getting it played. But then I I, I had no idea it was banned. I found out in a bit. What 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 I, what, I don't know what it was banned for. I mean, it's a great song. Well, it's banned because we call Reagan a fascist yeah. god, and the establishment <laughs> don't like those kind of sentiments. Really, it both hurts, I guess. <laughs> we didn't really hide it behind any kind of metaphorical uh, stuff, and we just said it as it was. Really, yes. Yeah, oh, brilliant. And then I, I mean, it's been quite well covered. I'd recently heard, well, Mark and I heard LCDs cover of it i don't know if you heard it yeah but. i have yeah i prefer ours to be honest oh. but I, I'm, I'm quite a fan of lcd sound system so i'll let them off <laughs> and it's probably got one of the most iconic album covers of the of the era i mean um i mean that for me is still one of the coolest covers i remember going into a similar record shop to yours in sheffield called downtown records in romford and going i love the cover i knew what it was anyway because i was familiar with you but that just wanted me to get it home even quicker and get it on my turntable. Who's, who's, who's I think I think it's fucking brilliant. It I is. still do. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's still stunning. Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, right. So the way that came about was um, that Ian used to. Um, he had a really incredibly creative mind. I mean, he, he in another world, he'd have probably been like you know, the top creative in an advertising agency or something. I mean, the quite shy, quite nervous, you know, yeah. had brilliant ideas. So, but we all had a big eclectic um, appreciation of lots of different influences coming into our songs. So we were not, it wasn't just like the traditional rock thing where we just wanted to be in that field. We were more interested in hanging out with like graphic designers and yeah. photographers and, and, and we were interested in, in news, you know, and, and, and world affairs and stuff. So he used to, sub his dad used to subscribe. He used to subscribe, sorry, to, um, Newsweek. Right. And, um, which for a 21 year old lad from Sheffield is quite unusual, I have to say. <laughs> and uh, we were trying to think of coming up with ideas. It was Ian's idea for the, the title Penthouse and Pavement, which we loved. Yeah, it's great. Like our socialist you know, kind of thing. And then, and then um, we were thinking, what can we put on the cover? And we'd just been now to Virgin, we were talking to them, and as Luke would have it, Simon Draper showed us the painting on the cover of the Skids album, which was, um, you know, the one that looks like a yeah. Russian constructivist yeah, yeah. thing. And um, we said, that's great. Is that a, an original post? Said, no, it's this artist who's been working with a lot of uh, Virgin artists called Ray Smith. As, and um, Ian went away, and the next day he, he pointed out this advert in Newsweek, which was like a Toshiba advert, and it was like this kind of really incredibly bland 
kind of world corporate, you know, opening doors all over the world, yeah. Toshiba, people meeting and d doing all this. I wish, could, I wish I'd got the original image that the, this was based on because it's a similar construction. Sure. We said it has to be painted. We can't do this as a photo collage. We need somebody to paint it. Can you paint something like this? So what, what Ray Smith did was he took us down to Townhouse Studios and took a load of Polaroids and then assembled them, and assembled them into a collage and then painted the collage. And um, that's why it looks so incredible because you've got different distances. It's just it's amazing. Uh, and, and I just thought, look, whatever happens, this is a work of art, you know. It is. And it, yeah, as you say, it still looks as good now as it did the day it was released. It's yeah, so because it's that timeless thing again. Evil man with racist views Spreading all across the land Don't just sit there on your ass And like that funky chain dance Brother, sister, shoot your best We don't need this fascist crew thing Brothers, sisters We don't need that fascist crew thing Brothers, e Equally as well, um Around that time, I mean, electronic music was quite metronomic and quite cold, whereas the way that album is synced, where you've got the penthouse side and the pavement yeah. side, you've got a very soulful electronic side, yeah. you've got a very electronic side, which is, again, that's another thing that was head of the game when that, when that album yeah. came out. True. Um, the second side were, were backing tracks that we'd already been working on for the next Human League album. Yeah, but they weren't completed. They were like sketches, sure. uh, so we we basically took those away and said, "You're not having them. Uh, these are ours." And um, w then we wrote top lines over them and lyrics, yeah. etc. So we had to we we had the we had like those four or five songs, whatever it were, was, and um, we went. Well, do we want to write another? Four or five songs that are this, you know, it would that would have been the logical thing to do sure. is to write another bunch of songs in that format. But we were so keen to break free from the constrictions that we created for ourselves that as soon as we discovered, and that is really like God handing it on a plate to us, is is accidentally stumbling across John Wilson because he's. I still think he's a fucking genius. I mean, I've had innumerable famous bass players coming up to me and saying, who was that kid? Yeah. He's quite a mysterious figure. He was 17. Wow. When he did that. Wow. And uh, I've had, uh, you know, Flea coming up to me talking about it. I've had, you know, it's unbelievable. Anyway, and he, he, he'd, be, he'd never played bass when wow. he did that bass solo. He just bought it in a car boot sale. Wow. He's a rhythm guitar player, and that's why he was playing it like a rhythm guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which is why it sounded Upside so down as well, because he was left-handed. <laughs> wow. wow. What a yeah. clever guy. Can you imagine how our, how, how our jaws hit the floor? Yeah, I bet. When, when, Because when, we were just trying it out. It was just a kid who was working as a stagehand when Glenn was working at the Crucible. Wow. And he went into the green room and said, "Is you know, is anybody play bass by any chance?" It was a long shot. We didn't know any musicians. We weren't musicians in our <laughs> own eyes. So he said, and then this, you know, kind of really shy young black kid puts his hand up and goes, "Well, I kind of play bass." Yeah. Backwards, <laughs> left hand. So he did the bass solo and did the rest of the song, and then at the end of it, we said to him. And he, he said, it's not, I don't really play bass. Uh, and uh, and uh, I said, what do you play? He said, oh, I play rhythm guitar. I said, do you think we could go back and get a, your rhythm guitar and you could try some rhythm guitar on it? And um, so we like the idea of the first half of the song being like what you, more or less what you'd expect, a bit odd, but yeah. fast. But then, the, then people going, you know, Fuck me. That's a real bass guitar, isn't it? And then that's a real rhythm guitar. We were big fans of Chic, of course, and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the brief. 
you know, he didn't, don't need to say anything else. He, he completely got it and then put his own twist on it, you know. Wow. Yeah, amazing album. Amazing album. We have to play. as well is when I was playing it in my bedroom was the never ending run out groove <laughs> <laughs> that took out. ages for us to do <laughs> but it was, it was the, the the it was put was it Porky's Prime Cuts the guy who used to do it he used to have his own little kind of brand yeah, yeah. on the run off groove and uh, we said we'd got this idea because we actually I'd seen it done on another album and I really can't remember which album it was. I think it was like it's some kind of ambient electronic album or something. It might be been Tangerine Dream or something. Right. Where it just kind of went on forever. And I really liked the idea. But I never, before that, before we did that, come across anybody who tried to do it in time. That's the thing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it was just good fortune, to be honest. That he worked. Uh, it could have not worked at all, but it just the, you know, 33 RPM at that particular point did fit the, the length of the yeah. bars. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I remember listening at the time, first time I heard it, thinking, bloody hell, this is going on. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, a, it's quite clever. I must admit it's quite clever. I think yeah. I, I was very happy with that. Yeah. That's, he's, he's a classic album. Uh, but on the BEF stuff, mate, I mean, I know you've done three compilation albums. Yeah. Is there any plans for any more of bit from BEF? Or is that, I mean, I, um, I mean the first time you've got so many other things going on, but just one. Well, there, there's two things. One is um, that it's hard to find anybody to support it financially. So if. You know, if I'm going to devote all my efforts to getting people to do it and asking favours from them to do it, not really paying them very much, and then there's no guarantee at the back end that anybody's ever got, you know, they can Fair listen enough. to it on Spotify for nothing. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just, where's the incentive? That's, you know, that's... Apart from just an artistic one. Mm. Uh, it's not like the back in the day. I mean, I made the third BEF album which I'm very proud of, by the way. But, you know, nobody wanted to pick it up, amazingly. I mean, in the end, it was put out by uh, on Wall of Sound, which is Mark, Mark Jones's label. Yeah. He, he, I mean, basically, he ended up on Cooking Vinyl, who had already turned it down. I didn't realise he had a licensing deal with them. So it's like, just never got promoted. They spent... Without uh, without my approval, they spent twenty odd thousand pounds on a video, and um, wow. I never got I, I got paid bugger all. Yes. And um, I, I'm going hold on a second. What's going on here? The video yeah. director's got paid. Yeah, I spent three months doing this, pulling all of the favors I could to get this album made, and I'm very proud of it. Mm. And it, and they didn't put any effort into the marketing of it as well, so it sold about three thousand copies. And you can, I just can't work on that basis. So, I mean, I'm not going to let the BF brand die, though, because we do live gigs, as you know, and um, uh, it's just the the whole uh, nature of the music business is so messed up now. And you yeah. work with some great artists on the BF. Yeah, well. I'm very proud. I mean, you know, I think people appreciate the artistic intention of it. Sure. Yeah, right think. from the outset. I mean, I, you know, I, I had lots of help from Virgin and, and the A and R staff and everything when we were putting the first one together because I didn't know anyone. But my view was, you know, what's the worst that can happen? People say no, so I just used to pick the phone up to yeah. their management or preferably direct to them and just appeal to their better nature. And most of them went for it. You know, some didn't. You know. Yeah. No, I, still I, tried, I tried three times to get Bowie on it, but he wasn't having it. Uh, no, he's very nice about it. And Kate Bush. Oh, that would have been good, yeah. But now there is a time. A tortureless sublime. Our souls are locked and frozen. Plus, we were years ahead, but now those thoughts are dead. Yeah. 
I mean, as, a, as a producer, I mean, you also, I would say, relaunched the career of Tina Turner. Um, and you produced the first Turner's Trent Derby album, yeah. which was, was, was huge. I mean, um, your production work is fantastic as well. Thank you. How did you get the Terence Trent Derby one, for example? <laughs> it's a good story, actually. So, obviously, once I'd had the success with Tina, then it's like it's like getting a promotion to the Premier League. You know, all yeah. of a sudden people are calling you up, and and um, and, and that's um, that went on for years. And I did quite a few other productions, and uh, and I'd agreed. I think I was doing loads actually. At the same time, it was the same time as Hem Seventeen was kind of tailing off. My production career was taking off, and um, I think I'd agreed to do a production for someone. It used to come almost like in three months blocks. I'd do albums and stuff, and then I think I'd agreed to do some work with Wet Wet Wet. I'm not absolutely certain about that. But anyway, I got something in the diary. Uh, just been agreed and then I got this tape sent to me on a bike by this young lad called Lincoln Elias who worked at, at Sony said Martin you got to listen to this I, I said I rang you up and said thanks very much Lincoln um, why did you think of me and he said oh I did a project on BEF oh, wow. at school he just come out of school he did a project for his A levels on BEF can you believe this? So anyway, I listened to the cassette and it was like completely blew me away. It just sounded like uh, brilliant outtakes from a Stevie Wonder album. Yeah. And uh, I'm going, this is in the voice and the arrangements, the songwriting, yeah. the lyrics. And I'm going, God I, almighty, well, I'm, I, uh, I hope it looks okay. <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> and then, so I, I, I immediately uh, rang him up and said, "Look, can we have a meeting tomorrow? Because I think it's really good." And um, we met, and we got in like a house on fire. And uh, and it, of course, he's a god. He's like a fucking god. He looks like a god. He dances like a god. Yeah. And um, I just thought this guy's, I mean, bulletproof star. I mean, the only thing that can mess those things up is like drink, drugs. Yeah. Unreliability, you know. Yeah. But it's clear it's clear he was he had all that going on. And he didn't drink and he didn't take any drugs, so I'm going all right. So um we got on well and we started working and it was like I remember saying to uh, Terence saying saying to Terence, you know nobody's going to uh <laughs> nobody's going to uh, buy this in America because there's so many soul singers in America. And uh, next thing you know, it sold nine million copies in America. You know? <laughs> and he's on the front page of Rolling Stone saying, "I'm a genius." You know, and <laughs> and he, uh, he he told me he was doing as as almost like a kind of experiment, stroke art, uh, arrogant artwork, and he became the person that he invented. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and we're still in contact, but I, I mean, I spoke, oh, really? to, spoke to him on Friday, yeah. Uh, we've kind of properly reconnected since uh, I, I interviewed him. Yeah, I heard that. Podcast. I heard that on your podcast. Yeah, yeah. podcast that. And uh, he's an amazing person. He's a whirlwind for sure. He's fiercely intelligent. I mean, he's got, uh, he, 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 was da he was properly kind of traumatized by what happened to him uh, post-hardline, according to. I mean, but, you know, I, I think he got probably... Uh, the fact that he moved to America and got surrounded by uh, people who were more than willing to spend his money probably didn't. Yeah, know. yeah, yeah, sadly. Mm -hmm. Mate, one of your other many talents, uh, this, this immersive... yeah. The surround project that I think was did you launch it in two thousand something with Vince? Um, yeah, I've seen a couple of press releases recently. So, what's going on with that? We're still doing it. We still get um, approached to do projects. I just finished a big project in a in a palazzo on the Grand Canal in Venice um, about global warming and its effect on sea levels, etc. Um, I'm currently 
in the process of putting together some proposals for some of the big projects. Um, that's all happening. Vince is kind of like a sleeping partner in the arrangement now because he lives in America. He's got his own issues, but um, uh, but if we ever get any big kind of com any big uh, compositional commissions then Vince comes in and we do that together. But I'm the kind of soundscape guy, if you yeah. like. I'm the one who does all the kind of chasing of work. He doesn't need any he doesn't need work. He's he doesn't need the money. He's you know, he can do what he wants. Yeah. Um but you know, he's still uh, we're we're, st we're still in the same company. <clears throat> and I believe it's the future, I believe Is it is it putting like a three D sound image into a space? Really? Yes. That's exactly it. Because so, I, saw, I saw a, I saw something online yesterday where it was from Immersive. Yeah, and it, was, it was a grid. Yeah, that's right. This was right. spinning orbs. That's the visual. That's the visual representation of where each of those orbs would represent a sound in space. Mm. I mean, I've got three. This is my three D sound studio as well. Yeah. So I've got two rings of speakers in here, one at the ceiling and one at ground level, and uh, and so I create them in here and then. Then you go to I don't know Trafalgar Square and you go. This is the new locations for the speakers and the and the software does the rest. Yeah. Um. So we've done about sixty or seventy major projects around the world in the last wow. two years. Amazing. Um. I guess that could be applied to live music at a venue. I mean. Uh, well, we d we did a three D sound gig at the Roundhouse. Yeah. Um. Which was mind bending to be honest. Um. And uh, the, we did Luxury Gap, actually. It was the Luxury Gap tour. And we did, you know, the start of um, Crushed by the Worlds of Industry is like a thunderclap. Yeah. Yeah. What we did was we stretched the, the storm 10 minutes earlier and created a 3D storm wow. in darkness as oh, the intro God. to the gig. And it sounded fucking amazing. I oh, mean, yeah. literally, people were going, "What is going on?" Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! And um, yeah, so that was quite something. So we, that was uh, another kind of creative thing that we were very proud of. Uh, but we've done. I mean, I've done live three D DJing at Fabric, you know, and and. Um, uh, I've done it in, um, you know, live 3D DJing in California at the wow. University of Southern California in the open air, 150 meters square. We've done, uh, I mean, the whole Millennium Bridge during the Olympics, uh, Trafalgar Square, we've done Leicester Square. I mean, all over the world, Mexico City, you know, you know. Yeah. Amazing. With your, you, I mean, you've got a finely tuned ear. I mean, any new bands that you listen to that you could tell our audience about that you're loving, or you just don't have the time, or. Uh, um, I teach, um, I teach masters uh, songwriting and writing to commercial brief and production at Tile Yard, which is where I am at the moment. So I rely on. Um, for a lot of news recommendations from my students, basically. Nice. Um, and th there's just an endless amount of talent out there. Is yeah. it, that's not, there's more than ever. Uh, the issue is, can they make a living out of it? So it's all right. I mean, I love, you know, black music. I love rap. I love experimental music. I've got completely eclectic tastes. But... Unfortunately, I see a lot of students coming through my hands who are have been kind of are being shoehorned into their talent into just being like this kind of baked bean production, you know. Um, yeah. These are the rules of the game, EDM or whatever, you know. And I just it's not for me. You know, I, I like free thinking, kind of freewheeling stuff, and we do have some amazing students who do that as well. Mm. So my answer it's a bit of a long winded answer, but. Um, what have I listened to recently that I really like? There's so much stuff. I really loved the last Avalanches album. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought that was a work of genius, to be yeah. honest. I really liked Stephen Wilson's last album. Yeah. Last Stephen Wilson. Wilson. Um, and um, I'm a big fan of Frank Ocean and people like that. Um, 
the more the edgier kind of electronic y kind of hip hop acts I like. You're right what you say, though, getting that cut through. I mean, it's one of the reasons Mark and I started this show, because, you know, when we were growing up, as you know, Marty, you had our great whistle, test, top of the pops, the tube. None of that exists anymore. I mean, apart from Jules, which is six episodes a year, there's nothing really helping bands. And as you say, there's so many good artists out there. Me and Mark are constantly putting them out on Facebook. Our community is now sharing good music with each other to try and give, you know, some of these bands a bit of a kind of platform to just get discovered you know if we help just get them somewhere then great but you're right it's a it's a tough tough thing to do much tougher it's, than it. it's factor isn't it? it's kind of like neutralized yeah. everything where it's just cover version well yeah i i don't know i i think about people like say for instance uh everything everything who i'm yeah. a fan of yeah great voice and uh and when they first came out i thought these are going to be huge you know, and uh, and the only and, and and a lot of those bands who are really good can only make money out of performing live and festivals and stuff like that. And their albums uh, are obviously trailers for that, but yeah. the actual albums themselves, if you release them digitally, um, it's difficult to make money out of them. Yeah, or yeah. Justify, justify the cost but i mean you know so i think the live scene of course that disappeared during covid so yeah yep. that's been more of an issue um it's difficult it's just very difficult there's so much, there's so much create creativity out there and the problem is not the problem the issue is internet marketing now there's no other reason to sign for a record company in my view unless you're tapping into their publicity machine yeah. yeah, you're right. You make a good point about, you know, digitally, it's, you don't make any money. If you don't make money, you can't produce vinyl, which you could make money on, but you haven't got the money to do it. So it's almost like a vicious vicious circle, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough to justify, for instance, doing another Hem 17 album. It's just, you know, Glenn's working on TV, doing really, really well on TV and film soundtrack stuff. Yeah. And making a good living out of it. There's still money in that scene. Um I could if I could never have imagined it would have got as uh, as as uh, as unprofitable as it has for uh, for young artists and legacy artists as well. Sure. Sure. I mean, you know, we're all right because we can do gigs and we can do we're doing our first American, you know, headline American tour later this year. And um so we're doing all right, you know, we're good live and I think people enjoy it. And there you are. In fact, in fact, you kind of preempted one of our questions about, you know, your last studio album was 96, I think, bigger than America. So yeah, no current plans for another one. It's hard to, you know, do we want to go through that? Do we want to go through that, that, that paradigm? Yeah. It's like, it's, it just feels like marking. It feels like uh, a bit of a sad kind of marking time thing. For yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I know mean, it sounds depressing. It's not meant to be. It's That's just can, can we justify the? I mean, if I'm you, if I'm doing something creative, I want it to be properly creative, yep. and I think it's worth a certain amount of commercial reward. Of course. Yeah. To do it properly, to do it to the standards. Why would I? Why would Glenn and I destroy our legacy for the sake of just saying we've got something new out? Yeah, that's a very honest answer. I appreciate it. No, I totally hear you. Totally hear you. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm all over it. By the way, if any of your listeners uh, want to finance Heaven Seventeen producing a new album, <laughs> but they'd, they'd look at the figures and go. Uh, it would have to be a vanity project, right? You know, because oh, I'm just, sure there's someone out there that might be taking, might take. Well, you'd be surprised. I think there's not that many. Certainly not record companies, anyway. 
It, the thing is, you're still, you know, you've still got a big audience. So I don't know. Maybe it's, let's see. Hopefully, someone might see this and go, you know what? <laughs> Fingers crossed. I'm the thing is, to- right? Okay, let's think about this for a second. So, say for instance, we do an album. We're really happy with it. It's got three or four what we would have regarded in the past to be hit singles. Where do you play those records? Yeah, exactly. Fair point. Yeah, and when I mean, yeah, I mean, I saw Newman make a comment. He had a really good track on Savage album, a million downloads. He earned thirty-two quid. You kind of go, what's the point? <laughs> I mean, that last Newman album was really good, but you know, yeah, uh, you know, he's obviously doing it because he does fantastic live shows, and he's getting good, you know, good money for that, and good, good on him, you know. Yeah, yeah. But that's really how it works now. That's the model. You say it's the live stuff, which you guys do very well and still yeah, people yeah. love it. And what I love is you see people like me and Mark's age, and then, you know, my daughter went to your last gig, and it's nice to see younger fans starting to, you know, yeah. fuss is about. Well, I did laugh when I went to Newman. I got on the train, and my daughter went, Dad, why do all those blokes look like you? <laughs> <laughs> the sea of bald heads at Wembley. But, you know, <laughs> it's, it's great that the young kids are kind of, following or getting into it as well i think that's that's really cool really cool uh well i mean the the there are so many 80s clubs around the country and they're all 20 somethings aren't they we go yeah absolutely so, you know they want to see the original things Mark, just very quickly any plans to do an autobiography please <laughs> it's coming out in august brilliant that's the best answer i've had i love that <laughs> august the 25th <laughs> we're just about to announce it later this week okay send us it's some links and we'll, we'll promote it for you and put it on our, brilliant brilliant no i love to, no, love to. absolutely so send us that stuff um look good luck with the rest of the uk tour and the us tour uh we'll definitely see you because i think you're playing Brighton at the weekend i think we are yeah yeah well, well it's mate, been, a ple- been a pleasure talking to you i really appreciate, thank you. Yeah, appreciate you giving your time up and speaking to us as well i mean yeah really appreciate it and we spoke, spoke to wolfgang fleur a, a couple of months ago and we speaking to new Arthur next week and we've got another few things in the pipeline but we do appreciate you giving your time up no yeah. it's all right no no it's not a big deal it's just literally so wall to wall at the moment i don't know what the i understand fuck. but no we'll definitely come and see it at the next tour mate and um thank you so much for staying in touch but send some stuff for the book we'd love to get well i will i'll pre- put you on the list of people we're going to send it out to thanks Martin. We'll, we'll, we'll promote it we'll definitely so brilliant Mate, thank you so much. We'll let you get it. See you at 11 o'clock. Thank you, Martin. Bye, man. Cheers. Have a couple of weeks. Take care. Bye.
So that's it for this particular episode of the Electronic Cafe. I hope you enjoyed Mark and I's conversation with the fabulous Martin Ware. Martin, thank you again, my friend. We absolutely love having you on the Electronic Cafe. We hope to get you back on again sometime in the future. So, as I said, also all the good announcements. A big thanks again to Tom Saunders at Blitz Magazine for being such a great guy, and uh, we're really excited about that. And I say look out for the announcement on the live event. Right, that's it. See you on the next episode of Electronic Cafe. Stay safe. Bye-bye for now. Thanks for watching the Electronic Cafe. We'll see you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye.